Well, uh, okay, okay. Eh, bueno, a continuación eh, nos va, va, va a participar de este panel eh, Giorgio Meta, que es un investigador del Instituto Italiano de Tecnología, radicado en Génova, en Italia. Bueno, muchas gracias. Y, mm, buenos días a todos. Um, y, pero la presentación va a estar en inglés. Um, so, the, um, thanks for the invitation again. I'm very glad to be here as part of the Volcano. Um, I'm going to talk about um, a project that is called, um, well, it's called ICUB in general. It's actually a collection of various projects uh, which started um, about six years ago on um, f f uh, sponsored or funded by the European Commission. Um, when the first project started was actually FP6, but the previous framework program, um, but then uh, we have many continuations, uh, between quotes, continu continuations, but follow-ups um, that are uh, in FP7. So we, uh, among the lucky people that passed the various thresholds and uh, got, got funded. Um, so, um, uh, a bit about myself, um, I'm from uh, the Italian Institute of Technology. This is a new endeavor funded by the Italian government um, with quite a substantial funding. Um, and in particular, I work on, um, uh, on a department that is called um, RBCS, which means Robotics, Brain and Cognitive Sciences, where uh, we have uh, mainly two disciplines uh, represented, which is neuroscience and robotics, and uh, how to make clear how this multidisciplinary um, endeavor is both encouraged by, in, in this case, by the Italian state, but also by European Commission. So uh, there are several projects that, in, uh, also in robotics, that try to bridge uh, gaps between uh, various disciplines, including, I mean, neuroscience is just an example, but we have also material science sometimes, uh, so it's, uh, it's a, a broad view on ICT in a sense. Um, and in particular, we've been working with this platform, uh, a human robot that we call ICUB, um, in, in various trends. I sort of heading the robotics there, um, and uh, we working on developing the hardware um, together with the software and also the research, which means uh, putting intelligence in, in the machines. And um, we've been running also a small scale production. Uh, of course, it's not like industrial productions. We're not building millions of robots yet, uh, but we've been building a few, which uh, poses some interesting constraints on uh, how the, um, the system has to be designed and uh, later re reproduced. Um, I had a few slides about the um, cognitive systems uh, call. Um, the, um, it's not, I mean, this uh, basically has been already presented here, so I'm glad to be able to skip a few slides on, on this topic. Um, the, this is where we've been funded mainly. Um, and uh, the, the one thing I, I may add to this is that the, uh, there's been um, an FP6 project called CARE, um, which sort of developed the um, re research plan or the research agenda for Europe in this topic of cognitive systems and robotics. Um, as you can see, uh, I think it's a well done exercise in the sense that uh, has been also industry driven, uh, looked for the commitment of various stakeholders in, in Europe being industry or academia, and uh, provides a view that goes from the short term, which is now, uh, to uh, five years and 10 years plan. And uh, this is public, and uh, it sort of um, shows also that uh, this um, work on cognitive system covers, uh, I don't expect you to read this slide, but covers most of this matrix, which has been devised as part of this uh, road mapping exercise which means that um, going from uh, the type of robots or the application scenarios um, and uh, the sectors being industrial, domestic, and so forth, uh, the funded projects, uh, each of these uh, little boxes, uh, one area where several projects may be funded, um, cover 
uh, almost entirely this matrix. This is for the um, past, but also for the last call that has been just uh, sort of closed or concluded. Um, well, uh, what about the robot cup project, the one we, which started everything? Was it um, an IP, one of the large projects, uh, funded for uh, about 8.5 million? And uh, the partners were uh, roboticists like um, ourselves, uh, the IIT, and also Scuola Sant'Anna, another place in Italy, in Pisa, um, as well as uh, University of Zurich. But we had also neuroscientists involved uh, from the University of Ferrara, also in Italy, and uh, um, developmental uh, psychologists from the University of Uppsala. So basically, the idea was um, to cover the science of intelligence uh, via neuroscience and developmental psychology, giving ideas on how to implement things on the robot. Uh, we had the engineering, building the robot, and we had the, um, well, a bunch of other activities. I'm going to enter into the details. We had people implementing not only the hardware, but also the intelligence on the robot, taking inspiration from uh, neuroscience. Um, there's been um, uh, several follow-ups, not all these projects um, are, I mean, we're not in all these projects. These are a list of projects that used our robot. So we basically uh, have a strong legacy, meaning that as we done the robot, we passed this platform to other people, and I'm gonna tell you how we done this. Um, and, and therefore, um, there have been other people reusing the same technology, which I think is important because provides um, a single platform where multiple researchers can strongly collaborate and uh, exchange things very practically. They can physically take a piece of software from one robot and move an into another robot. So the work uh, doesn't need to be done twice. I mean, we're not reinventing the wheel all the time. Um, so the um, initial project, RoboCab, um, had, um, is now finished in 2010 at three goals. Uh, the design of a human and robot platform, um, the making this platform um, the platform of choice for researchers in um, artificial cognitive systems, uh, at least in Europe, and uh, the study of cognition from developmental neuroscientific perspective. Um, the project's finished, but we still have a um, few goals in terms of more at the community level now. Um, trying to maintain the platform alive by following technology and improving on it, um, still making the platform a choice for researchers in cognitive systems, and uh, now studying cognition. Um, of course, we have our own take on how we do things on the robot, but uh, really we don't care. People can take this platform and use as they prefer, uh, even using approaches that we don't like, but in a sense, but uh, it's really to the researchers to use the platform f for um, doing uh, cognitive systems research. Um, so this is the robot. Um, as you can see, it's fully humanoid. It's fairly small. It's tall um, and uh, has a lot of degrees of freedom, especially in the hands. This was uh, dictated by the fact we wanted to be able to study manipulation. They're, um, they're strong. Um, neuroscientific uh, support for saying that um, um, various cognitive abilities that we acquire during development are actually through manipulation, through manipulation of objects. Um, the, and in fact, uh, even uh, there have been uh, people, neuroscientists have been finding connections between manipulation and language. Uh, so even high level cognitive um, skills are actually connected to manipulation. This is the reason for having hands, which are fairly sophisticated. So a lot of degrees of freedom in these robots, a lot of joints that are in the hands, upper body, eyes, and so forth. Um, the, the robot can crawl, sit, and manipulate. At the very beginning, it wasn't planned for uh, bipedal locomotion, although uh, the design eventually is good enough also for that. And the, um, the design has been, and this is a very important point, uh, has been made completely open source. So, and here we're talking open source not only from the uh, software point of view, but also from the mechanical side, electronics. The entire complete design documentation is available from our website, can be downloaded uh, and potentially 
somebody can take all this, this design and reproduce the robot, although it's still a fairly complicated exercise. It's not something you do in your basement. It requires a fairly sophisticated machine shop to, to make the mechanical parts that are required. Although the software can be reused for other applications, and this happened already, other projects have been taking the same software and reusing it in different contexts. Um, and by the way, there are, as you can see from the map, there are now about 20 robots spread across Europe. There's one in the United States. And uh, very hopefully, if we conclude the agreement, it's going to be one in Japan um, by the end of the year. So um, the, we're very proud of this because uh, having a human and robot, a European human, human and robot in Japan, which is like a, where the human and robots were invented in a sense, is very, uh, it's very interesting. Um, um, what else? As I said, um, we started to design why this robot is so special for us, because uh, we started to design from uh, the hands, but also we have mo mobile, I mean, movable eyes, uh, so we converge. Uh, the neck is, uh, can be moved independently from the eyes. So it's a fairly sophisticated platform which wasn't available when we started the project. I mean, we didn't have any replacement, any easy way to do uh, and go and buy a similar robot. Um, in terms of sensors, it's very human-like. It has cameras, microphones, gyroscopes, encoders, force sensors, tactile sensors, so forth. So try to squeeze as much as possible of uh, human-like sensing into the robot. Um, the electronics is all custom designed, and the reason was to be able to give uh, people the freedom to program to the very low level of the controllers. And this is, again, for uh, people doing robotics, it's fairly important. And uh, as, as I said, it's reproducible. Uh, so it's designed by a community of people. This the, the actual project was carried out in different countries. So we had the head design in Portugal, legs design in, uh, in UK, and parts design in Pisa, parts design in Genoa, and then we put everything together afterwards. So it was a true uh, Europe-wide collaboration. And, uh, and uh, as I said, it's reproducible, so we had a company in the consortium, and the company helped in um, applying industry-grade standards for uh, the mechanical design, for electronic design, and so forth. So we wanted to have something that is, when we bring the documentation to machine shop, they don't get crazy and, get, and actually can take these drawings and get us the parts back at uh, reasonable quality. And, um, uh, the other question is why we chosen the humanoid shape. There are scientific reasons. Um, famous paper by uh, Rodney Brooks at MIT saying that elephants don't play chess. I mean, the, the, the idea there is that, in fact, uh, our, the shape of our bo body determines uh, how we think. And, uh, and so to obtain human-like intelligence, you may need human-like body. Um, also, having human robot is um, useful for natural human robot interaction and poses uh, certain challenges. Having lots of degrees of freedom is a challenging uh, mechatronic exercise. And it's also fun, in a sense, because it's complicated, it's tough, and uh, makes uh, you know, an interesting engineering exercise. Um, the fact that the platform is, is open also makes uh, room for repeatable experiments, uh, for benchmarking, and for quality control, uh, meaning that once we have many platforms all exactly the same in multiple places in different countries, we can really repeat experiments. So it's not like uh, the single researcher doing a piece of software passing and just saying that it's good because it's good and because the paper has been accepted on a nice conference or journal. But here is actually taking the same code, running on to different places, and making sure it works. And uh, this very challenging, and uh, it, in a sense, it goes also beyond the, the strictly scientific exercise, but in a sense, makes um, uh, a bit more science because people can really repeat the experiments. Um, and I think these three topics resonates also with uh, some um, R and D in uh, in robotics at the industrial level. Um, uh, what else? Uh, one um, example that I like. And what we like to achieve, although we're not there, as you can imagine, um, is um, uh, the, the sort of the idea of the common hardware and uh, and uh, and the capacity to build a community around this hardware. One good example is the iPhone. 
where uh, Apple developed a device where then many, many application providers managed to uh, start developing for the iPhone and making an ecology of, um, of applications that are now makes the iPhone very useful for very various different applications, not only for making phone calls. Um, the same is uh, something which will be possible for robotics, which is uh, somebody provides the hardware and the software um, middlewares that are required for uh, standardizing this hardware, and then various people in different places develop applications. In the four videos, you, you can see in this slide, uh, there are, there's an application developed in Switzerland where a controller for multiple yes. joints was developed, uh, making the robot to be able to crawl. Um, there's another one in Germany where you have uh, mani manipulation exercise, um, um, building, matching Lego, Lego blocks. Uh, the one in Portugal which shows some visual abilities of the robot to detect events in the environment. And uh, at the bottom, you see another one developed in France, which shows uh, the robot interacting using speech. So different applications from different domains uh, developed by different people. Um, this is possible because we have a common software. I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not going to enter into the details here. It's a bit, bit too technical. Uh, but basically, um, this is very important to guarantee that people can develop using certain standards. And uh, we've been very keen in making these standards very open. So we didn't force anybody to go very strictly on a standard, but rather we provided tools that can cross-compile on multiple operating systems and using various development tools. So if you used to use uh, Windows, um, you're not forced to go into another in Linux because, I mean, people tend to get very attached to the systems they have and they don't want to change. So we made a very lightweight, um, thin layer of software that can be reused by many people. Uh, this enables things like this one. Again, don't read the details. It's, it's meaningless at this point. Um, but it's just to, to show that we've been able to take various modules, various pieces of software uh, in a complex application, merge them together, uh, be able to, uh, for instance, this application has, has been developed by uh, the CRIS project, another European project, and the parts of this application have been developed by uh, people in different countries again. Then we joined them, and they were able to communicate one to the other, and because of the infrastructure that we built, and uh, we managed to run demos like this one. Um, okay. This um The sound. Okay. The, what's happening here is that uh, the robot is instructed using speech to do a certain action. Uh, the action is parsed, passed to a reasoner that uh, chunk, uh, builds uh, or creates chunks of the, of the sentence, looks for the objects, the verb, and, and, and tries to then plan for a set of actions to achieve the, the object. It also combines object recognition so the robot can recognize different objects can manipulate them, so like in this case. Although it's not very fast, it's still able to do the task. So maybe there's a bunch of things to be improved, but it shows the principle. And, um, and uh, the robot always asks for confirmation here and there, and tells the user what it's doing. I reach the table, and, uh, and now starts the cleaning action. I hope you get the idea. Uh, of course, I mean, the same demo can be run for different things. So you can ask the robot to, uh, for instance, uh, pour the cereals into the cup or uh, do various actions. The point here wasn't very much on the actions that can be performed. Uh, this, by the way, is entirely vision driven. The robot is completely autonomous. And uh, so it doesn't, the, the only interaction with the user is actually via speech. So there's no, pre-program anything here. So of course, if we pre can pre-program things, we can go much faster, but that's for the, you know, we'll be improving on that. Um, this, as I said, the entire project is open source. Uh, these are the media we use for um, releasing our work. 
so there are wikis and um, repositories, lists of parts, drawings, and so forth. And the, the entire thing is distributed on the GPL, which is one of the main um, uh, licenses for open source. Um, we're not stopping there. Um, there's a new uh, version of the robot coming out that we call 2.0, uh, which mainly has two improvements. One is uh, the ability to control how much force is exerts in the environment. So uh, to do what is called in robotics force control. So um, as we interact with the environment, we can control the forces, and therefore we can make sure we don't destroy the environment or destroy the robot altogether. Um, and this is done by adding new sensors and also by adding uh, sensors at the level of the skin, uh, where we used uh, a sort of a reasonably standard technology in a new way um, and incorporated this technology as a robotic skin, so to give the robot the feeling of contact with the environment. And uh, this, are, this is another example where we use the uh, same technology for the fingertips of the robot. And uh, let me skip this. And uh, this is a video where we show that we can actually um, use this simple information for uh, controlling how much force is exerted to the object. So the first example is without control. Uh, if you take a lightweight object like a, um, a plastic cup, uh, you, of course the robot is able to squeeze it uh, with the controller in place. Um, can do a better job in avoiding crushing things. And uh, so the trivial example. Another thing where, uh, where you can uh, interact with the robot very naturally, if you have force control, you can use the sense of forces uh, to control how the robot moves. And this is an example where you can see that um, the robot is moving around and being driven by, uh, by uh, an experimenter. And you can see also that uh, very nicely uh, the robot is compliant. So you can touch the robot, move the robot around, and it complies with your extent, the forces you're applying. Um, and uh, to finish, a um, set of videos showing um, the various applications. First one, I'll skip the first one uh, for the sake of time. It's very similar to the other one I showed, showed earlier. This one shows, again, that the robot can move uh, coordinate movements, but it's still compliant to external forces. Same thing when it's crawling, we can actually move the robot around and it will nicely comply to the, the contact with the environment. This is all very important, and this is another example. This is all very important for one reason, which is uh, the possibility of having this robot in direct contact with people. And, uh, and we need to have this built-in mechanism for sort of safety and to guarantee the robot doesn't, doesn't hurt anybody. And these are examples of the use of this technology. Um, so to wrap up, um, there are still challenges for the future, like um, devising new actuation, which is soft as, as muscles, sensors that are as precise and effective as human sensors, and the new materials, maybe polymeric rather than uh, standard aluminum. Um, there are various technologies that in history changed the world. Uh, airplane, cars, telephones. Of course, they change over time. And uh, there's technology that is changing the world now. Uh, like, uh, you know, the, if you want the best application we know of, of artificial intelligence is Google. Um, and there's uh, the chance that maybe robotics is the next key technology that will change the world and hopefully for good. And um, this, uh, again, to thank um, the sponsors. And uh, thank you all. <laughs>